Okay, let's jump in with the Q&A. So I've got about 20 odd questions to answer. So the first one is, I would love to see how you plan your workouts and balance strength and skills. Maybe we could even get a video on it. Anyways, thanks for all the knowledge and effort and for giving away for free for those of us that can't afford a personal trainer's greetings from Argentina. Very simplistic way of looking at my training and how I like to program most of the time, depending on people's goals, is to have balance and mobility work bent arm strength and straight arm strength. Now this is probably the most common way of doing gymnastic strength training, is you split the strength stuff between the bent arm work, handstand push-ups, chin-ups and things like that, and the straight arm work, press handstand, skin the cat, planches, front levers, and those types of movements. So the first part, that balance, it combines balance and mobility. This is the stuff that we need to do more frequently and we can do more frequently because it's less demanding on the nervous system. We don't need as much recovery from it and our body's gonna adapt better with less intense sessions, but just more of them. Now I will make a separate video on this, but if you go delve deeper into the actual sessions, there's the, the warm up, the mobility work, the way you need to get the body ready to do your handstands. So for most people, this is gonna be quads, hamstrings, glutes, shoulders, thoracic, just basically getting the body in the best position to create that one segment, that one line. Most people are looking at an arrow type handstand or just really good posture from head to toe. We don't wanna be stuck in this position, trying to put our arms above our head. We wanna have really open hips, open shoulders and things like that. So the prep work before you do your handstands is what that's for. And then you have your, your flexibility skills. So pancake, splits, bridge, all depends on what your goals are and that will tend to feed the strength goals. So if your goal is a stall to press or a press handstand, you obviously need a certain amount of forward fold straddle flexibility to achieve those movements. And then the balance session will be depending on what I'm working on personally. So a lot of the time for the balance for me, it will be a one arm handstand component, but that all depends on where you are on your handstand journey in terms of the balance work. So most people so most people that are early on in their journey, they're trying to get their freestanding handstand. So most of that will be around working the wall drills, the toe pulls, the heel pulls, and getting you to that freestanding hold. And then it'll be working shapes like tuck and straddle to strengthen the balance, increase the balance window, and create more options when we're going to other skills. Then with the strength skills, once we have the foundations down, the dips, the chin-ups, the push-ups, the rows, the skin, the cats, I'll then be looking at specific strength skills. So again, that depends on the individual's goals, but normally you'll be looking at press handstand variations and or planche for the straight arm, handstand push-ups, muscle-ups, that type of thing for the bent arm strength. So normally what I'll do is I have that priority goal and then I'll superset with the opposite movement. So if you're doing handstand push-ups, then we'll be doing chin-ups. If you're doing planche, then we'll be doing front lever. But with the priority still on the goal. So if the goal is the planche, we'll be doing those reps and sets first, superseted with the second exercise that's probably a little bit less intense because we want to still focus on that goal. Because the most important thing with your training is consistency. So when I'm programming for myself, when I'm programming for clients, I always make sure that we're aiming towards their goals. So everything is around what they want to achieve because if you're not passionate if you're not excited about achieving the thing you're working towards you're just not going to hit your sessions for this style of training we do need to be training five six seven eight ten times a week so making sure you're heading towards the goal that you really want to achieve is really important for that consistency and keep you driving forwards on a daily basis question number two now there's two questions here Flexibility, what advice do you have for those who are really struggle with flexibility their entire life? Tight hamstrings, close shoulder angle, not even close to back bend. Of my flexibility problems goes on and on and that's after I've made it a priority for years. My improved state after focusing it is still worse than most people's starting state. Now with flexibility, you need to look at the whole picture. There's a lot going on here. The body will change tone and tightness in certain muscles depending on what the rest of the body's doing. It prioritizes things. So it prioritizes your organs. So if you have inflammation in your stomach, the body will close certain muscles, tighten them up to create space elsewhere. So females will get this all the time in their cycle. So their pelvis will change. So they'll go into more of an anterior tilt. Uh, and that's why they get their low back pain because the hip flexors will tighten up and the pelvis tips forwards to create more space in the stomach. It does not gonna to wanna to tighten your abdominals up against your stomach if it needs to create more space there. So it tips that pelvis forwards, tightens the low back, increases the tone in the hip flexors. I've seen this with males before who have been gluten intolerant, had this inflammation in the stomach they didn't know about and it was tightening up muscles in the body to create that more space. So you can get things like that. We need to look at things like hydration and then we need to look at how you're stretching, how often, what other things you're doing. So if you get someone like a boxer who's always in this position, so their position of strength is like this, they're gonna have so much tone in that in their pecs 
and actually training their self into a flexed position. So it's gonna be much harder for that person to train and open up because their position of strength is closed in this position. So you need to look at the whole picture. You need to look at what else you're doing, how often you're doing your stretching, the intensity you're using. I prefer to use less intense stretches for longer, more often periods of time. You want the body to go back to these positions and feel safe there. So I'll be looking at all those factors. So what are you doing in the daytime? What's your posture like? Are you behind a desk all day long? Are you doing a job that creates tone and creates strength in certain muscles and closes you off? Are you training regular enough? Are you hydrated? So there's lots and lots of things there and it's really hard for me to say without assessing and give you more detail. But I hope that helps in terms of thinking about all the different things that could be. Now I personally found creating a daily practice. So visiting the positions every day, making sure I got to that same level. So if I was getting elbows to the floor in a seated pancake, I would do that every day. And then the following week, I would try and get a little bit deeper and just slowly increase. And for me, this meant nine, 10 o'clock at night in front of the TV, I would be going through my stretches. And then whenever I achieved that next level, I just made sure I kept visiting it and also using that range in my training. So I'm not only stretching to that point, but I'm using that range when I do a strength skill. Hope that helps. There's a bit of a tricky one without assessing everything as an individual, because it will be quite different for everyone. Huge variation in results from month to month. In July, I was holding tuck planche for 22 seconds, hips high. Last week, I held one for eight seconds. My back levers simultaneously went from 30 seconds to 17. I don't know why. Weight consistent, training regime consistent, and focused on planches for straight arm push day. I don't know why I regress or suddenly break through a plateau. For all my training, planning, and trying to match cause and effect, both my successes and failures seem disconnected. Again, it's a tricky one without assessing everything that's going on. So you wouldn't need to look at nutrition, sleep, workload, stress, all of those things, just to check there's no inconsistencies there. Now it is normal to go up and down with the body weight strength skills. And once you lay it all out, you can normally see some inconsistencies somewhere else. So for example, I'm struggling with my stuff at the moment. I'm in the process of building that app, video and lots and lots of demonstration videos. So my training has changed quite dramatically in terms of what I'm doing. I also went to the UK for just under three weeks and was eating and drinking food that I normally wouldn't. I was teaching workshops and then not training for a few days. So it made sense that my training and how my body is feeling is all over the place. But if the consistency is there with everything else, it's probably something else. So I'll be looking at your flexibility and your positions. So basically what happens is if you're a little bit tighter when you go into your planche session, your body to get into that same position needs to use more energy because your body just wants to pop open. It doesn't want to stay into a tight tuck ball if it's tighter. So you can achieve that same position, but you're going to use more energy to get into that tight ball, which means that you don't have so much energy for balance or to hold for time. The days where you're more flexible, your body will naturally go into that tighter ball and then you'll have more strength available for the skill itself. If you're doing a strict ring muscle up and you're tighter, you have to go out and around the rings. Again, it's a harder pathway. Same with the press handstand. Your legs need to go around more. Your hips are gonna go further out, away from the base support. It's gonna be much, much harder to actually get the skill. The days where your flexibility is better, everything's gonna stack and you're gonna flow through that pathway much easier. Okay, next question for rings false grip. What would be your favorite way to train strength in that position, bent hand? So obviously we need to have a certain amount of flexibility there. So if we do lots and lots of handstands, I struggle with this one. I'm in this position a lot. I'm not in this position so much. So in a straight arm position, so when I'm like this in a false grip position, it's much harder for me to hold that position just because of lack of range, lack of flexibility. And you could also argue lack of conditioning in that position. So just not enough time spent there. So number one, we need to open that position up with some false grip mobility exercises. My favorite one is putting the knuckles together in a tight fist, uh, putting the back of the palm onto the floor and then straightening the arm for repetitions. This one you just have to be careful with that you don't start to open the fist back up and lose that tight grip, that tight position with the fingers, trying to escape out. But you can play around with external rotation as you do it as well. So internal and external rotation of the elbow, um, will change how it feels. And then in the rings, when you're on the rings, you can do the same thing. So when you're, you're straightened out in that um, straight arm position, you can turn the rings out uh, and it's much more comfortable to, to get to that bottom position without losing the false grip. So that's the flexibility for strength. Uh, we can do uh, different exercises in the false grip. So we can do false grip rows. So obviously a good place to start and then 
uh, progress to false grip chin-ups. Uh, conditioning wise, we can hang out in the position. So I can just spend time hanging in a false grip position. If that's too hard, I can have tiptoes on the floor. Next question, for your workouts, do you mainly focus on drills or do you mix strength days in? I'm used to following a push-pull type plan, but I don't think that's what you do. Just trying to figure things out. So I covered that a bit earlier in terms of the way I answered that. I'll answer this slightly different, so in a quicker, more brief way. So yes, basically I split mine between flexibility, handstands, straight arm strength and bent arm strength, and I alternate those things. So I alternate the strength skills. The balance and the flexibility is what I do the most. So most days, I'd say every day, I'm doing some sort of balance work and I'm doing some sort of flexibility work. So they're being maintained or slowly being progressed. And then I alternate the bent arm strength skill and the straight arm strength skill. So normally one day I will do a bent arm session like handstand push-ups. Now whenever I do handstand push-ups or muscle-ups and things like that, I'm normally doing a pulling movement in the background somewhere as well. But the priority is the pushing movement or the skill. So say the skill is the handstand push-up or the skill is the muscle-up. And then I might do, if I'm doing handstand push-ups, I'll do some chins or pull-ups in there as well. If I'm doing muscle-ups, normally I won't because there's a push and a pull combination there so I'm doing uh, the chin up portion of the muscle up and the dip portion so you're getting that pulling movement and the pushing movement with the straight arm strength it's more around the uh, press handstand and or planche work and then I'll superset the opposing movement so if I'm doing uh, skin the cat sorry if I'm doing press handstand it'll be skin the cat and if I'm doing planche it'll be front lever now what I put out in terms of my content is normally the skill element. So if it's a handstand push-up session, I don't normally show the chin-ups, but they will be there in the background. But the priority for me is still on the pushing movements, the pushing skills, because that's what I enjoy the most and that's what I get the most business out of as well in terms of coaching. Oh my God, this one. Okay, next one. Did you ever have limited shoulder flexion for the handstand? If so, how did you fix it? So obviously that's one of the most common things is people who can't put their hands above their head. And definitely when I started, so if you go back to like nine, 10 years ago on my Instagram, which sounds like a lot, but just scroll back, you'll see it. You'll see that my position was on more of a banana handstand. And I definitely struggled with that overhead position. And I worked on this in a few different ways. Now, uh, in hindsight, so if I was doing it again, I'd be a little bit more targeted, do it in a slightly different way, just from my knowledge now of coaching other people and then just my own experiences of going from that tight shoulder position um, to a more of an open position. Um, so number one, thoracic. So the thoracic spine I would focus on more than the shoulder itself. So a lot of people are doing really intense or quite aggressive shoulder opening exercises. Um, but they're not addressing the thoracic. And most people's thoracic spine, so their upper back, is rounded too much. And it doesn't matter how much you open the shoulders, if your thoracic is still stuck in that kythotic position, that rounded upper back position, you're really gonna struggle to take your arms above your head, or you're just gonna have to really make your shoulders flexible. And in, uh, in a lot of ways, you might actually damage or hurt your shoulders because they're trying to compensate for that real stuck position. Now, if you're an age that I was when I started so at 37, uh, it's gonna be pretty tight. Your upper back is gonna be um, rarely stuck. So you're gonna have to give it time, but little exposure on a daily basis, I think is the best way to go for that. Um, so I would be doing spinal drapes, long uh, lay on a foam roller. So one of those really long foam rollers, laying down on your back on there, doing that on a daily basis and just relaxing in that position. Uh, if you're a little bit more supple, if you don't need that so much, go straight to the thoracic extensions. So sideways movement on the foam roller, open and closing in that position, making sure you're not compensating in the neck, you're not compensating in the low back. And I would combine that with daily hanging, so passive hanging. Ideally hands shoulder width apart. If you're really stuck and you look like your arms are bent in that position, uh, just start with your hands a little bit wider apart. If it's very, very hard for you, you might need a toe assist. Um, but doing like a 60 seconds to two minute passive hang on a daily basis again is going to really target all the shoulders and all that upper back area. It's also going to help just head to toe mobility. So I'd include that and then whenever I'm doing a handstand session I'll include some sort of shoulder extension or shoulder flexion stretching exercise uh, whether that's the floor based one making sure the hips stay on top of the knees going up onto fingertips make sure you're looking at the fingers so we're 
in a position that's very similar to the handstand and that the toes push into the floor. If the toes aren't pushed into the floor into this position, you tend to arch through the low back a lot more. So really try and keep in a strong posterior tilt. And then the last thing I would do is your daily training. So whatever you're training, making sure that you're trying to open up as much as you can without losing balance. So if it's handstands, prioritizing the balance, but trying to get in the best possible position you can while maintaining balance. Now this is a tricky thin line that you have to be careful with because a lot of people try and get into a handstand position that they can't actually physically get into and they get so frustrated because the line that they're trying to get into actually like spits them out of the handstand so it makes them feel like they've got no balance but it's because they're trying to achieve a handstand line or an open shoulder position that's too advanced for their current mobility. Next one, can you suggest a good progression to achieve tuck balance from tuck planche. So I'm not 100% sure what you mean with this one, but there's two main positions that we need to make sure you've got as home positions. So the tuck planche, if you're doing any type of calisthenics, if you wanna do any type of press work, I recommend that everyone works the tuck planche and achieves that at a minimum, because that just opens so many doors in terms of presses uh, and straight arm strength, and it's just really good for the scapula. It's so good to have a very strong uh, protracted position. And then the tuck handstand itself is one of the main foundations of a really strong handstand. It's gonna really develop that upper trap area. I apologize, I need new windscreen wipers. So I'll be focusing on addressing and building strength and conditioning both of those positions, both the tuck planche and the tuck handstand itself. Tuck planche, there's a lot of different variations you can do to get into it to build the strength and conditioning there. Basically, you wanna be scared to positions where you can hold for around 10 to 12 seconds for multiple sets. So that could be toe assist, that could be band assist, that could be tuck slides, or it could be a combination of all those things. And I'll be doing the same for the tuck handstand. Now the tuck handstand does demand a lot more mobility, so I'll be combining the two. So I would be doing mobility work against the wall with the chest to wall holds. So in 90 degrees or have your upper leg um, parallel with the floor and then doing holds there, making sure that the shoulder stays on top of the hands. If it's easy, walk the hands in closer to the wall. The same drill, which is good for is tuck slides, so going from a straight position, passing through that 90 degree hip position, where the femur creates the most challenging part because that's the longest part where it makes the hip go furthest away from the wall, puts the most demand on the upper traps and shoulders. And then combining that with your balance work. So if you're strong enough in your two-arm balance handstands, uh, combining some freestanding tuck holds and transitions from straight to tuck. And then once you have that, going from the straight handstand coming down to a tuck handstand, through the eccentric tuck press to the floor, and then eventually going to, down to a tuck planche hold. So you go from handstand to tuck handstand to tuck planche and then eventually opposite direction once you can do really slow eccentrics and work some partial range uh, you could go back up so eventually you can get from that tuck planche all the way up to handstand and if you can do that that opens the doors to skills like stall to press multiple press handstands elevated press handstands when your hands are up on an elevated surface just basically allows you to control the tuck position from the floor all the way to the handstand how many times a week should we practice the handstand I mean, it really depends on how much of a priority it is to you. I've practiced the handstands every day for the last 10 years. Uh, I'm a bit like that. If I get into something, I don't want to stop. I want to do it all the time. Um, but I also think that it's a skill that if you want to get good at, we need to be doing it on a regular basis uh, because it's a bit like learning to walk. So when you learn to walk, you basically kept trying over and over and over again until you needed to eat, sleep, or go to the toilet and then you got up and tried again, and then eventually you got a point where you could take a few steps and then you just carried on walking. So I reckon walking on your hands or being on your hands, standing on your hands is very similar, so it needs to be a regular thing. Um, I don't, I think most people will get stuck if they're only training it once or twice a week. They'll get to a certain level, uh, unless they're not adding any other sessions in or anything else that carries over to it. I think they'll get to a point where their balance will be um, plateaued and they'll struggle to continue in some way. And that happens at lots of different levels. I think you really need to take it on 
Uh, and if you're doing other skills, other training, whatever it is, whether it's yoga or CrossFit or strength training or anything, I would just do a little handstand practice as part of your warm up to it. So every time you're training, you're doing a, a balanced practice at the start. Uh, you do need to be a little bit careful when you first start in terms of conditioning the wrists, the hands, the shoulders, uh, getting the body used to being upside down. So you have to be careful that you don't do too much too soon, but that's normally a volume thing or a lack of preparation. Um, so just make sure that you're warmed up, start with very small short sessions uh, and then slowly increase the time. And maybe you do two longer sessions per week and then you do t uh, lots of little mini ones throughout the week. Uh, but I recommend anyone that has big goals in terms of handstands are training five, six, seven times a week or building to that. Hi, I train in muscles on the rings about one year. I can easily do 10 pull up to chest with proper grip on the rings, but still struggle with the transition over rings. Not sure how to develop a new skill and power. Okay, with the ring muscle up, we have three components. We have the chin up, the false grip chin up, the transition, and then the dip. So most people do get stuck on that part from where you finish the chin up and you go through into the transition. Now repetition is key here. So understanding the movement. So making sure that when you're doing repetitions of the transition or of the, uh, the part where you get to the top of the chin up and you transition into the transition from the top of the chin up to the dip, that you're spending enough time there doing reps of that. But when you have like toe assist, when you're doing the transitions, you want it to be exactly the same as the actual movement. So a lot of people will train the transition, but it's a bit false. So it's not the real thing. And that's the hardest thing when you break these movements down or make them easier or add an assistance, uh, it's not the real thing. So you need to have to try and train as close to the real thing as you can. So repetition first, we wanna make it very, very light on the toes, but have enough assistance so you can just do lots and lots of repetitions there. And if you covered the feet up, it should look like you're doing the muscle up transition exactly the same as it would if you had no. So starting in your support position, lower into the bottom of the dip, and then going as slow as you can through that movement to the top of the chin up and back down again. Make sure when you're doing the transition that your chest uh, is always in contact with your hands or your hands are always in contact with the chest. You trace the line of your pecs and as slow and controlled as possible. So test it with that real slow eccentric and video it from the side and then rewind the video so it will look like you're actually doing the muscle up and it should look like the real thing. If it looks false, if you're coming away from the rings too much, if you're dropping through any of the movements, that's where you need to work. That's where you need to spend more time. That's where you need to make it a little bit easier and make sure you're doing something for repetitions that strengthens, has good time under tension, but also mimics the actual thing as close as possible. Okay, next one, do you have the planche? Okay, let's prove that now, what level my planche is. Now, if I go cold in the middle of the trees, like this, can I get a tuck planche comfortably? So, there, yes, I can tuck planche, I can frog, I can go to a dodgy straddle position, so that's cold. That's in the middle of the trees, just doing a walk, not warmed up. Once I warmed up, I can get high hip straddle planche for around eight to 10 seconds. When I was training it a lot, I was really trying to get a full planche. Um, I got like a full planche for like two seconds, maybe one to two seconds, but that's it. So no, I can't do a full planche on tap, ready to go. If I train towards it, I could probably get very close to it. Uh, I do a lot of planche-like movements when I do 90 degree handstand push-ups, when I do dead presses, so that carries over a lot. So when someone says, can you do a planche, it depends what type of planche. I recommend that everyone trains towards a tuck planche if they're doing calisthenics, handstands, bodyweight strength. Me, myself, if I have to describe where I am with my planche journey, I'll say I have a high hip planche at any time. So I can lower down from handstand to a straddle planche, hips are quite high, legs are a little bit piked, that's where I describe my planche. Okay, I find my shoulders really stiff, which makes handstands more difficult. I try to hang from the bar daily and stretch shoulders before handstand, but I need a lot of time doing the warm up to make them open enough to keep more or less straight line. What's your approach on that? So two there, this basically goes to that other question that I answered in terms of how do you open up your shoulders? Uh, and have I suffered from having closed shoulders? Um, so obviously be, be aware of where you're at in the moment. So be realistic in terms of what you can achieve for your handstand line. 
uh, but then as you slowly warm up during the session demand more from your line so every session that you're you're doing you're slowly warming it up you're spending more time in an open position and you're demanding more depending on how you feel so if you trained chest yesterday if you was tight from sitting at a computer all day yesterday so don't expect yourself to hold a really good line from the get-go on that session following that, but make sure you are including mobility on a daily basis. So hanging is awesome, but I'd also, ha I'd also add in that thoracic mobility, using the foam roller, plus doing some work when you're actually in the handstand. So you can do the ones where you kick up to the wall, opening the shoulder, you can push off the wall and trying to push out into that position. You could lower your feet down into like a, a back bridge position there, opening the shoulders, just make sure the shoulders stay on top of the hand. So I would be doing it. So I would continue doing it as your daily practice in terms of your hang, if hang by itself. I'll be doing all of those things while still trying to get into an open position as best you can during your handstand sessions and gradually over time you should see a big improvement in your shoulders the other thing to think about is that when you're doing handstands you're probably in a position of strength so what that means is that your body is finding the best position for the demand that you're giving it so if you're someone who trains something like boxing or something where you have a closed shoulder position then your body thinks that's your position of strength. So whenever you go into something that's stressful, your body's gonna close into that tight, locked down position, and you're then probably fighting yourself to get into the straight line. So you need to slowly teach your body that your position of strength is more of a straight line, like the handstand line you're going for. So give it time and make sure you're training it regular enough to become the norm for you. What are your tips for a good kick up into handstand? I tend to overbalance and fall. So I would, definitely work towards underbalance. So the underbalance gives you the most variability. I can bend my arms, I can take my shoulders forwards. So if I'm just gonna kick up in the middle of the pathway here, I'm gonna place my shoulders on top of my hands. I'm gonna make sure I'm in a comfortable position with my hands. So I'm not gonna go too close together. I'm gonna give myself the best chance of getting into a handstand. I'm gonna kick up with control, keeping the shoulders on top, pick the focal point. So I'm picked up focal point in the middle of my hands there. And then when I kick up, I'm going to slightly underbalanced position. See, my shoulders are slightly forwards. And then from there, I can push up into handstand if I have that. If I don't have it, I'm going to stay slightly bananaed in this position. And I'm not going to push up. And then coming back down, I need to make sure my shoulders, my focal point is still the same. And then I kick up again. So I'm doing repetitions of practicing that kick up, making sure everything's the same every time. And I'm allowing myself to be slightly underbalanced, not overbalanced. Overbalanced makes you feel like you're going to fall all the time. It's a smaller window. Under balance, if you've trained it especially, you'll have a really big window and you'll never fall out of the handstand. Many hand balancers recommend slight overbalance to control the handstand with the fingers instead of aiming for the neutral. It makes sense because if in under balance, the palms cannot help much and once has to use other parts like the shoulders to balance. Does this apply to power lets too? I train almost exclusively on power lets and I feel more solid in a neutral position as the wrist can control the balance either way. If anything, it feels stronger to control under balance than over balance with the wrists. I'm asking this because I'm aiming to control the handstand without using my movements at the shoulders, hips or legs, thank you. So going back to that kick up, what we're doing there, I'd actually do the opposite to what uh, has been suggested to you. I would practice more under balance to neutral. So neutral to under balance is your get go and your over balance is your last resort. If you go to overbalance, if you try and kick up to overbalance, you're going to fall more times than you don't. If you kick up to slight underbalance or neutral position, you're going to find you've got much more play, a lot more uh, control, uh, especially on P-bars. P-bars, if, you, if you're elevated, you want to make sure that you're not falling, especially overbalance. You want to always be in control. If you want to do presses, handstand push-ups, uh, other strength skills, coming down to planche and stuff, it's all about underbalance control. And then over time, it will, you'll settle more in a neutral position. But you always wanna have that backup of your underbalance to catch and move around. I wouldn't be kicking up to overbalance, I'd be kicking up to underbalance or neutral between the two. I hope that makes sense. What do you do to recover from overtraining, overreaching? I will get excited and push too hard on one day and be exhausted or in pain the next. If I fully rest, it feels like the body gets stiff and doesn't recover. So this one's quite tricky to answer without knowing lots of things about your training in terms of what your goals are, what intensity skills are you going for? Because there's a big difference between going for like a one rep max. Now, a lot of people don't think about one rep maxes, but when we train body weight strength skills, we're often training at our one rep max without thinking about it. And if I said to you, okay, let's do one rep max deadlifts today, 
uh, you, you know you're gonna be really fatigued tomorrow. But when we're doing one rep max muscle ups or handstand push ups or press handstands or even handstand balance, then that's gonna fatigue our nervous system, probably not quite so much as doing a deadlift, but it's still gonna have that same fact. So we need to make sure that when you're training, you're still playing around with repetitions. Your main workload is happening in your like five rep max, five to 10 rep max, especially for conditioning, we wanna be even slightly higher than that. So make sure that when you look at your training, your overall load, that you're thinking of it like that. What's your one rep max? What's your five rep max? What's your 10 rep max? Uh, and try and juggle it in terms of fluctuating those days. So if you have something where you're working one, two rep maxes, the following day uh, you're doing more balance work, you're doing higher conditioning work. What I wouldn't do is go crazy with your training and then take two or three days off complete rest. Think about mobility, think about balance work, think about conditioning for, on the days following the, uh, the more intense sessions. And you can ride it, like you don't have to have it all planned out. Um, I don't really plan mine out in that way, but I, but I know that I'm gonna do, so yesterday I done a really hard handstand push-up session and chin-up session, I'm sore from it. I done um, demo videos of pistol squats, my legs are really sore today. So I know today's session is gonna be much easier. I'm just gonna do a little bit of balance work. And because yesterday's session was intense for the bent arm strength, I'm gonna do some intense work today, but it's gonna be more based around the straight arm strength. So it's gonna be different to what I trained yesterday. So it's more of that, it's juggling the type of training, the repetitions in terms of the intensity, body parts, and then type of training, straight arm, bent arm, strength, conditioning, balance. Okay, next one, regarding the press handstand, how do compression drills such as straddle leg lifts actually translate to application in the skill? It's not something readily obvious when watching it performed, and I feel like I'm missing a crucial piece of the puzzle. So press handstand is one of those skills that until you can actually do it, it, it makes no real sense. It's really hard to explain what muscles you use, what do you think about when you do a press handstand, the activation, the compression, the, uh, the movement itself. If you asked 10 people who can press handstand what, you know, to describe the feeling when they press, uh, they would all describe it completely different. They would be thinking about different things. So that makes it quite a hard movement to coach, to teach. Um, but what we can do is we need to tick off the elements. So we need to tick off, do you have the flexibility to allow your body to get through the pathway? That's number one. Number two, do you have the balance and control to, per per to perform the pathway as needed to achieve the skill? So that's something else. And then what I like to look at is do you have the home positions? So do you have the start of the press handstand? Do you have the handstand itself? And then obviously the pathway between the two. Now compression work and compression itself comes into that package of stuff. The issue with compression, which you often see, is people are overworking the compression. Now this is either because they're very, very flexible, so they lack the control, so they feel that the compression or the squeezing of the torso to the legs is gonna like control that range that they have, or you get the opposite thing, where someone actually isn't flexible enough, so they try and use compression to pull both parts together. Now the second one will really get you into issues because you can't physically move the two parts together. So if you sit and straddle, you can't take your chest towards your legs if you don't have that flexibility. It doesn't matter how strong you make the, uh, the compression, how many leg lifts you do, and you normally find that person is actually performing the leg lifts incorrectly to help them with the press because they can't get to that range. They're leaning back against the legs. So instead of trying to understand how the compression helps you to get the press handstand or how does it fit or what you need to think about when you do the press, I would just perform really slow eccentrics. So ideally freestanding and then video that from the side and then rewind the video watching it and assess yourself. What gaps do you have? Now it could be you don't have a controlled eccentric. So if you don't have a controlled eccentric, we need to work out how can we make that controlled. So that might be making the shoulder. Now I had to pull over because the SD card was full. So what I was saying is you need to do that it's real slow eccentric to see where your gaps are. So you might be that your shoulders aren't strong enough. It might be that you need to slow the movement down, learn how to do that. So you might need to go against the wall, roll the back down the wall. It might be that you can't articulate the spine correctly. 
It might be that you're not flexible enough and it might be that you're lacking compression. I doubt it's the lacking compression one. Normally, if you look at the flexibility and the controlled movement of the eccentric itself and the strength of the shoulders, you'll find you're missing links there. And normally that eccentric will tell you everything. And then if you combine that with partial range training, plus working those home positions, that bottom position, making sure you can get on your tiptoe, get your hip crease to be on top of your hand, you'll normally find when you put all that together, the press will suddenly appear. What would be a good one arm handstand drill to do three or four times a week at the beginning of training sessions? So for the one arm handstand, I think you need to make it as simplistic as possible. I think we don't need hundreds and hundreds of drills unless you're on that sweet spot, you're getting really close to lifting the hand and getting some real time. I would keep it as simple as possible uh, and doing it at the start of your training sessions is the best time to do it. Um, just make sure you're warmed up enough. And then literally you just wanna see what drill you can do for eight to 10 seconds. So for most people to start with, it's gonna be learning to weight shift. So you get some flags, get some weight shift, get a nice solid straddle handstand, and then get to the point where you can pull that together. So you've got your, your solid straddle handstand. The more flexible you are, the easier it's gonna be. Make sure you can flag on both sides. It doesn't have to be an amazing flag. That's gonna go with your flexibility. My flag is terrible. And then put them together so you've got the straddle, you've got the weight shift, and the flag, and then you hold a position. So you go over as much as you can, making sure that the shoulder, elbow is pushing towards the midline, the shoulder's pushing towards the midline as you go over to one side. And then you wanna get the pelvis as close, or the center of the pelvis, the sacrum, to stack on top of the shoulder as you can. So the goal is to get those three things to stack up. So your sacrum, your shoulder, and your hand. Get as close to that and then hold there for time without going too sideways. A lot of people will go sideways and they'll stick the leg out to the side because they're compensating for lack of uh, position. So if you've got lack of position and you're not stacking correctly, then we need to work out how you can slowly improve that and just spending time as close as you can to that position is gonna give you the best uh, development in that area, whether it's conditioning. I wouldn't personally use wall drills, I would use freestanding. And if you're not good enough to be freestanding, you need to work more on your freestanding handstand. So eight to 10 second hold for a few sets on both sides. Now remember, you're gonna have a dominant side. I've got a massive difference between mine. So you wanna do that eight to 10 second hold, whichever makes sense on each side. So for me, I would be going eight to 10 second one arm on my right side, so I'll be lifting the hand up. On the left side, I'll be going one finger down for eight to 10 seconds for multiple sets. So that's how I personally should be training. You need to do the same, but just at your variation in terms of your progression towards that one arm handstand. So it could be palm down, just flagged over and holding for the time. It could be up onto five fingers. It could be two fingers. It could be one finger. But majority of the sets, you want to be returning back to two arm hands, two arm hands, to a two handed handstand uh, with control and then coming back down. And that tells you you're more or less in the right place. Okay, is it possible achieving the full uh, front lever without training their progressions? I mean, only training full front lever negatives, dragon flags, and dynamic exercises like weighted rows or L-sit pull-ups. Potentially is a good way to answer that. So I think a lot of the lever skills, back levers, front levers, you do get for free for training other skills. So if you do lots of planche work, planche leans, 90 degree handstand push push-ups, skin the cats. You're gonna get good lever control. I would definitely train uh, tuck front lever, tuck planche, skin the cat skills like that. Once you've got all those down, you can then play with the skills that you really wanna achieve, where your passions are, and you'll probably get close to getting that. I personally train variations of the skin the cat up to a 360 pull. So a 360 pull is the dynamic version of the lever, so you start so we're not having much luck. My GoPro then overheated while I was driving. So what was I saying? So basically, if you're training things like front lever pulls, if you're doing 360 pulls, which I was doing uh, up to the point where I got straight body 360 pull, you now enough get a front lever. And then it runs into that, like, what is a front lever? What's a full front lever? You know, is it two seconds? Is it 10 seconds? Is it just being able to control the position for amount of time? So, you know, I can comfortably do full front lever to muscle up, but I'm only holding the front lever for one or two seconds. I haven't got a solid 10 second front lever that I can have a conversation in. So some people would say that's not a full front lever. 
So it basically comes down to what your goals are, what your skill goals are, how do you want to use it. Yeah, so I'll be interested to know other people's thoughts on that. Like, what is a skill? Is it a, is something, uh, do, you, do you obtain the skill when you show control in that skill for a certain amount of time? Now, obviously that's statics. Something like a muscle up, it's like a controlled repetition with no kip, but some people would prefer a kip uh, because it's more efficient and you can get more repetitions. So it is really down to how, what you're training for and what your goals are. No, Rosie, 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 no, no, no. Uh, the next one, adding static hold exercises good for adding in training sessions uh, so I, th I think that means is doing static holds uh, good for adding into training sessions so so definitely um, like holding a protraction hold a planche lean uh, a planche itself a front lever hold pauses in positions uh, I think that's really good to increase time under test tension making sure your tempos are correct filling in gaps I think it's really really useful to do both static and dynamics so used in the right way 100% yes how to stack hip over shoulder during kick up in handstand. So that all comes down to your mobility. So obviously the more stacked you are before you do a kick up, the better, uh, as long as it's controllable. So if you've really got your hands and your feet really wide apart, so your hands are here and your feet are here and your hips are here, then you have to go around to get up into the handstand. So it's gonna send you in that direction. We ideally want you to go straight up to handstand. So any excess energy takes you up, not over. But then you do run the risk of going outside your flexibility. So stacking too much, so then your body wants to pop out to the side so that the kick up position spits you out to the sides. So the thing you're trying to get better at actually gets worse. So that's basically impossible to answer 100% without seeing the person and, and looking at consistency. I would do that. I would set your hands, your shoulders on top of your hands roughly within a few centimeters make sure that your focal point is somewhere close to being between your index fingers and keep those things exactly the same and then experiment with different foot position which is going to change your hip height and just see what your consistency is like and then over time as your control gets better as your flexibility gets better you will normally bring those two things closer together and your hip will be more stacked when you kick up but video from the side and watch what's happening we don't want this movement we want this movement going straight up into the handstand. How to progress into ring dips. So obviously standard dips are really important. So making sure that you can do dips on P-bars, making sure your push-ups are strong, but also you wanna make sure that you're doing the basics on the rings. So I would be holding a support position on the ring. So straight arm, making sure your arms are pushed into your side, really strong support hold. Make sure you can hold that for like 20 to 30 seconds. Do the same in the bottom of the dip position. So having your bicep or your shoulder touch in the ring, again, keeping your palms glued into the side. Uh, you can have toe assist if you need to, but get to the point where you can do that without the toe assist. Once you've got both of those, then doing the eccentric. So starting in the support position, slowly lowering down to the bottom position and holding there. And then you could do toe assist to get back up or use a band between the rings. The band's pretty good because when you put weight on the band, it pulls the rings together. And I normally get most people to carry on with their P-bar dips and keep making them stronger and stronger while they're working on those static positions on the rings, getting used to the rings, uh, and then move it over to 100% rings as long as you can get the volume in. Something like uh, three repetitions by five and then working up to a five by five. So that's the Q&A session. Make sure you add any other questions relating to those questions down below and any other questions you'd like me to cover in future sessions. I wanna do these a little bit more often. Um, I often get questions on the bottom of the comments and I don't always see them. Um, I'm getting lots and lots of comments on like nearly every hour now I get 100 or so comments on my YouTube videos. So if I miss any of your questions, make sure you either uh, just send them again, uh, tag me if you can do that, DM me on Instagram. So if I don't respond, that's the reason why. Uh, but make sure you keep answering the, asking the questions in a different way or a different format or just, like I say, DM me on Instagram is normally the best way. But again, that can get flooded sometimes. Uh, it just goes up and down. So let me know if you have any other questions and I'll speak to you soon. Thanks, guys.